welcome to the May 28th uh, Heavy School Committee meeting. Like, uh, can I get a motion to call the meeting to order? Move to call the meeting to order. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, adjustments to the agenda. Let's see, there is no executive session uh, tonight. We'll discuss the program of studies um, immediately after we discuss the changes to the graduation requirement. So, no exec session, and we'll move. Um, program of studies up to B mm -hmm. and then um, so then we'll go into the special education uh, formative evaluation. Any other requested? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, um, moving then right into presentations. Uh, letter A, Hopkins history graduation requirement. So we discussed increasing the graduation requirement currently three years at Hopkins to four years. The school committee had a good conversation about that. And at the end of that meeting, hey, Jack, okay, he's quite interested in this. You can sit wherever you can sit right here. We just started talking about the history of Florida. So the school committee had discussed this previously. Mr. Burns and the history department brought it up for school committee consideration. We Currently, there are no schools in our surrounding area who have a four-year requirement right now. And some of the questions the school committee had during their discussion were what do the students think about it? What does the guidance counselor think? Does the science department have any feedback? Because science is still a three-year requirement for graduation. And um, would it impact course offerings? And what would the financial impact be? Essentially, would it require an additional FTE? So Mr. Burns did that analysis. And I included his notes in your packet. And so in the packet, you see uh, some of the feedback from students, feedback from the guidance counselor, and from the science department. And also, Mr. Burns put together what it would look like uh, if, in fact, there were a four-year requirement. Um, so he shows that there would still be many electives offered and that it could happen with existing staffing. Um, so Mr. Burns is here to answer any questions that you might have about the information that's in the packet uh, or any questions you have in general about this consideration. I would say I was glad to see the feedback. I mean, it was um, confirming and just reinforcing it, but uh, it helps, I think, to just have those perspectives brought in in terms of feeling like the recommendation is backed, you know, fully by uh, the folks who are impacted by it. Um, and it was good to see, too, with the science acknowledging that, you know, that's, it, it's okay for now, kind of, you know, right. maybe that's a future vision, but that there's no um, perceived kind of inequity there, which I just, I think we wanted to be sure that we were covered on those bases, too. Paul, you guys, it's yeah, all yeah. fairly positive feedback from. Well, I guess I just had questions. I, I agree with you that there, there are two things. One is, um, well, first off, I hadn't heard the feedback from the guidance counselor that seniors were having trouble finding courses to round out their senior years. So this, ever more reason, I think, to expand the uh, history uh, curriculum. I guess I'm just curious, Annie, what would be your thoughts uh, quickly just on the science? considering your requirement for science. So I think uh, in terms of considering a, increasing that requirement, I like the process that we did for looking at this. So when, I, it, one of the things that encouraged the history department to take a look at this is that the, the new state standards, the new curriculum framework in history, changes requirements, puts an increased emphasis on civics, has an expectation that students are introduced to civics in an in-depth and formal way in the middle school, which pushes some additional content requirements up to the high school. And also, there's repeated reference in the frameworks to 12 years of history. So, I mean, unless you're doing an intensive year in kindergarten and then uh, <laughs> hanging out as a junior, that would imply that the state has an expectation that there's 12 years in grades one through 12. So in terms of science, I would, I would adopt a similar process as ask the department to look at the requirements, um, make a recommendation, get feedback from, feedback from students, and then demonstrate the impact that it would have also. I, I would certainly be supportive of it, but as I said, I like, I, I like how history went about doing that. Thank you. 
I appreciated the, op the openness, too, that the students were uh, willing to share. Um, and whether or not, you know, in terms of availability of courses in, in the senior year versus actually getting something that they feel is useful and applicable and, and obviously extending into AP, you know, the opportunities with that, it was good to hear that. Yeah, we're trying to make sure we have an honors advanced track, but also a non-honors advanced track. Because mm -hmm. we're very leery about getting too heavy on the honors AP side, because that's not all of our students. Right. <clears throat> And yeah, I'm, I'll be honest, one of my big concerns when I, when this was first brought up was um, school choice, trying to market ourselves and um, the thought of myself as a student, if I knew that one school is going to require more than the other, I might not be wanted to do that, but hearing that feedback from the students um, that really saw the benefit of it, um, really, I, I thought that was really great information and enjoyed seeing that. Uh -huh. Okay. Are there any other questions? I, this is an action mm -hmm. um, item in terms of approving this, <coughs> given that it is um, a graduation requirement. So it would be um, getting a motion to approve the four-year history and social studies graduation requirement. Just one more question. Yeah. Is there, so based on the science department's feedback, is there a discussion about going through the similar process that was went through for history to determine if it is? So I think feasible? that, do you, was that the sense that you got from Kathy Nigel when you? She's certainly you open so, to it and yeah. thinks that that discussion needs to happen. Okay, so we yeah. could use this as a, a way to initiate yeah. that discussion mm -hmm. um, in following a similar process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that would cover all four core areas, which mm -hmm. I think was our initial kind of reaction mm -hmm. was um, wanting to end up there ultimately. Mm -hmm. All right. So we need to Any other questions? <clears throat> and I would just ask Mr. Burns that you make sure that I have this. Uh, I need to add the year to this to the action item for that. Yeah, so it becomes effective with uh, the class of 2024, the current seventh grade. The current grade. seventh grade, yeah. Did I do that right? It sounds like math to me. I'm <laughs> the current not seven is off. I only know <laughs> math's not my department. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. So that's approval for your history and social studies graduation requirement beginning with the class of 2024. Great. Is there a motion? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you for bringing back the information. Very You're welcome. Helpful. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Thank you. Okay, Shuna. We're going to move next into um, the Hopkins Academy Program of Studies. Right. So okay. I, we do yeah. have up, one updated enclosure. Mm -hmm. um, yes, here we go. Just a, a change to the grade levels. The garage band uh, is a middle school elective for seven and eight. Mm -hmm. So the only change, since you wouldn't have this, Paul, is that originally in the packet it said that garage band was a 11th and 12th grade elective. It's actually a middle school elective. Um, and so in the packet, Mr. Beck has provided a copy of the master schedule and information on four new courses. I can briefly tell you about Public Safety One and Fire Science and Emergency Management. So what we're looking to do beginning next year is start putting together a, a public, safety, uh, public Safety and Administration Academy. Students would be able to take four courses total. We'll build this over time. Um, they would end up take, have, be eligible to take four courses total, do a specific kind of internship, and then that pathway designation would be on their diploma. Uh, in some cases, if they finish all four courses, uh, they would be in a position um, to have completed all of the credits that they would, not all the credits, the preparation that they would need in order to be a candidate at a fire academy. I'm also in communication with the president of Greenfield Community College about having matriculation agreements and dual enrollment opportunities for public safety administration and fire sciences. We're starting with this option. It's something that Ware Public Schools has done and it's quite popular. And our public safety officers, Chief Spanknabel, uh, Lieutenant, uh, the Deputy Chief, the Lieutenant, and also members of the Hadley Police Force are willing to teach these courses 
And the teacher of record would be the guidance counselor. That's how we report it in School Brain, since you need a certified teacher to do that. But the people delivering the content would be our own police and fire. So we're pretty excited about those two offerings um, beginning next year. Uh, if they're approved by the school committee, and as I said, fire and police are ready to uh, start teaching those. And um, Mr. Beck can talk a little bit about the other two, which are Garage Band and Hands on Humanities. If I could start on the back, it's just one additional statement that rounds out the description of the curriculum is this is the course where students in the seventh grade they get their preliminary exposure to languages and while we work on a lot of other skills in there we're extending the amount of time that students spend because it'll be a year-long course rather than a semester course and so one of the things that we have discussed is um, breaking up the way that we currently have students uh, get exposed to both French and Spanish so that as they get into eighth grade that they can make a choice um, and we're going to involve upper level students in front us uh, French and Spanish 3, 4, and AP uh, to also be able to come into class to do some demonstrations as part of that because those courses are honors courses and that would be part of the honors requirement. Um, so it's just adding that one item to the description to round out the description of the curriculum. And then GarageBand is part of the middle school rotation, something Mr. Bartlett has wanted to do for a long time to um, be able to either effectively recruit students to the music program um, by having them uh, get involved with the music program despite the fact that they might not have any formal music training. Um, and it will focus, it's a course that will focus on uh, having students come out to use everything from technology to actual instruments and their voices and hopefully be able to put together performances that would either be done here in school, uh, perhaps not even in front of people, all the way up through the idea of cultivating a talent show as a fundraiser, which we could include anybody who you know wanted to do something in there. So <clears throat> I think it's a great option, given that we'll go to a three-day rotation in our middle school elective. So he'll teach band, chorus, and garage band in that rotation. It'll be open to all seventh and eighth graders who wish to take it on. So there are a number of students who, down at the elementary school, had played ukuleles. Uh, for a period of time, and it would be nice if they were able to come up and continue something, especially if they're not members of the, uh, the chorus or the middle school band right now, um, that maybe that would be a great recruitment tool for them to dig in and decide later in life to learn how to read music and catch up to their peers. I've heard that ukulele and garage bands are wildly popular. Yes, yes. I see them out all the time. I, I, I pay top dollar. <laughs> I would totally see a ukulele. <laughs> <laughs> But um, <laughs> with the garage band course, are there any um, expenses that you can think of that, like equipment-wise or software purchase-wise, that are you know of substance here? No, not not that we've planned in at this particular point. We have some software that can be used currently. Mm -hmm. um, if students wanted to do something, we would have the opportunity to um, put in for mini grants with um, the board of trustees or. Um, Helping Hearts for Hadley Schools, Hadley Mothers Club, if there's something that comes up where we could see something that would move forward and have some degree of sustainability, I think that those expenditures would be relatively small and manageable through grants. Is this something that would take up as much time for Mr. Bartlett as middle school band and middle school chorus currently take up? Yes, but in the three day, we're going to add, the middle school is going to go to a three day rotation in their electives, and so it, it will. It will be 60 days. So of the 180 days that they meet, um, band will go from 90 to 60. Um, chorus will go from 90 to 60, and garage band would take that third day. Will uh, do you think Miss Brett will be able to like handle this extra class in addition to chorus and band concerts? Well, he was the one who proposed it because he wanted to do it for the purpose of, of helping really to recruit kids. And there is no formal concert uh, requirement. There's no formal proposed performance right now. So there isn't an additional performance on top of it. And it may give a space in the schedule for him to do additional time with either the middle school band or the middle school chorus without pulling students from academic courses as well was kind of his idea. So if they needed additional time for a dress rehearsal, they could come on the garage band day without missing an English class or something like that. I was excited to see the um, public safety courses too, like in terms of 
real world applicable skills mm -hmm. that are also potentially transferable to a career, like with the direct, um, you know, going in the uh, fire academy mm -hmm. uh, connection. That I just thought that was really cool in terms of, again, marketing strategy mm -hmm. when we think about, you know, some of the unique aspects. Um, and you mentioned how popular they've been in other districts. Too. They have. It isn't just where, there's also a district out east um, that does this. I want to say it's Pawtucket Regional School District and there is a <coughs> chance that it would take some time but it is reasonable to assume that we could develop a chapter 74 approved program in criminal justice with this as a base mm -hmm. so not only to is the goal to recruit and retain students but it also could present a viable alternative to a vocational tuition in that specific area I really see all four of these as um, just kind of like quintessential small town education type of thing, like things that you, like things like that that hands-on things that you can get, um, which is really I'm really excited about all of these. I feel like there's been a lot of talk, even from a parent's point of view, about trying to bring back some of those things that the vocational schools offer. So this is a start to that, and then hopefully we'll spark some interest in some students. I'm also, I'm, I really like the garage band idea. I really like that kids can come in and kind of get an idea and get a feel for it if they haven't been exposed. So I'm really excited to kind of hear how that goes for him. Um, I also really like the idea of hands and humanity that kids are going to really be exposed to different languages so that way they can choose so that way they don't start one course and then realize, geez, I wonder what it would have been like and get a better idea. So I, all of them, they sound really exciting. <clears throat> Good. I think, um, Brian, one thing that we talked about at a, it was either last meeting or the meeting before, um, I was asked a question by a, a parent about um, what channel to go through to bring at, back some of the more um, home economics, vocational type classes like uh, food science, sewing, CAD, woodworking, um, and shop for the middle school. So at the time when we talked about it, uh, we said we wanted to explore getting feedback from the students because we had seen, I think the year prior, that um, international foods had been offered, there weren't enough enrollees, so we needed to switch up um, what was offered that particular, uh, for that, that particular semester. Um, so some of the things we talked about was including student feedback on additional courses in the future for a program of studies, um, and with those, uh, pieces of feedback, also coupling it with staffing needs and equipment needs, given, you know, we just talked about some of the equipment or, or even the what fire and safety personnel are able to offer in terms of resources, but I could see where, you know, woodworking and shop and other, um, some more, uh, obviously, courses that require very specific equipment or safety um, concerns that it's you know, that needs to be coupled with any kind of student survey just to make sure that we're prepared to be able mm -hmm. to do that. We have the space be to be able to offer it. Um, so that's just a future consideration that I think um, this absolutely is a, a step in, towards that type of direction, um, but making sure that we continue to uh, offer classes that students are interested in and we'll, we'll see some strong enrollments in them. Great. I can work on that with Mr. Kelly. <laughs> From the people I've talked to so far, just in our grade in general, when I've mentioned the kind of stuff with these new classes that we're talking about, there's definitely a lot of interest in them. Whether that's just because I offer vague descriptions of them, <laughs> or I'm actually interested in them, I guess we'll see, but uh, I'll at least say that a portion of the student body seems to be excited to see what we're going to be offering. Well, it sounds like, too, with something like uh, GarageBand, for example, that uh, as an alternative to being part of an ensemble, you know, that you have the opportunity as either on your own or with a, a group, a ukulele group, for example, a small group, um, to kind of mix that. There's the computer aspect of recording and mixing and, you know, creating a, a demo and kind of, you know, getting feedback. That just seems like people are, that, that's what people are doing now. And kids are doing that and it's accessible. So mm -hmm. I think that's exciting as a way to, it's still music education, very much so, um, but it's not necessarily, you know, I'm in band or I'm in chorus. 
I'm just picturing School of Rock. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, it allows students to be able to, again, have another area where they have to build their collaboration skills, mm -hmm. um, build their leadership skills. Uh, they, can, they get an opportunity to work on production skills and, and begin to learn, you know, really group dynamics in a really informal way that can be quite formalized as, as they, they're in with a group of people. <clears throat> and those interchanges of what they're looking to do and who they want to collaborate with evolve over the course of the 60 days of the course. Yeah. So it'll be an interesting pilot for the year. And hopefully, out of it, we can cultivate the people that we're losing from, um, you know, we're losing some huge players from Pep Band this year who are really key. And I know, you know, Jack All is taking, bands. he's expanding uh, his, his repertoire of uh, instrumentation That's so right. that yeah and diversifying things and so hopefully we can cultivate other students who are interested in joining even if they don't read music to to jump in and become a bass player for the pep band or, or become the guitar player because there are probably some kids out there who play it who aren't part of the band of course yeah and you're going to be a one-man show. I'm going to get you one yes. of those big things where you have Jack three on the drum. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Strap to you. A flute, the whole thing. <laughs> Do it all. So it Keyboard. brings up a good point. <laughs> there are a lot of kids who take private lessons, such as in guitar and whatnot. So the, the <clears> other thing that I would say is we just want to make sure that we're communicating effectively to the elementary school, too, and things like mm -hmm. step-up days. And not just to the students, but the parents as well, to help get that information across to them. Because mm -hmm. in that recruitment, and retention part, if they know what's to come, making sure that it's not just the high yeah. school that's aware, but mm -hmm. the entire district. We have we have that plan for the, both of the transition events, uh, the two most important transition events, the parents' night that is before step up day. Yep. And then on step up day, we get the whole seventh and eighth grade together. So registration will take place through the, the community portal with the exception of the middle school electives because they'll be bringing those home that day and we'll look to get uh, have folks go either go into the portal or get their information back from the sixth grade after the teachers present how that would work over the course of the year and what those courses are all about and what they're like. So both six, incoming sixth grade parents as well as sixth grade students will get an overview. Okay, so these courses will be highlighted too mm -hmm. as the new yep. offerings. And, that's great. Is scheduling happening soon? <clears throat> yep. So you should have probably everything when you wake up in the morning ready to go. So. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah, Paul, did you have any yeah. questions? No, I think they're great as well. Great. Okay, this is also an action item. Mm -hmm. What is that? Is there a motion? A motion to approve the Hopkins Program of Studies 2019 to 2020 with the uh, revisions that were presented tonight. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Great, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And now we will move to uh, special education initial formative evaluation programs and resources. Okay. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, so I, um, when I started this first year as the special education director, I also enrolled at the same time in a leadership institute through the state. So it, I had like four days in the summer, and then I've had like four different days throughout the year. So we also had to do a capstone project for that. So I've kind of grouped both of these kind of projects together this year um, to really just take inventory of what we have in the district for resources for special education students, um, like what different programming we have and what different um, tools that we have for what the special education staff is doing with the students when they're coming to work with them. So my goal this year was kind of to look at that, take some inventory, uh, meet with the teachers, and then kind of make some conclusions and uh, recommendations for next steps. Um, so at the beginning of the year when I had come with um, Jen and Brian and we had presented, we talked about, um, I talked about like the overall goal that I wanted for the department was to really make sure that all students, regardless of their disability, had um, the opportunity to progress in all the areas academically, in the least restrictive environment, um, and really wanted to highlight working with families, teachers, and staff. So with all of us working together, you know, I do believe we can do lots of good things for students. Um, so the next slide that I put on the presentation um, just kind of highlights um, I know you guys probably already know this, but I kind of just wanted to organize it, like what is our special education staff that we have in the district. So we have five special educators, three at the elementary school, two over here at Hopkins. Uh, we have the two school psychologists, one full-time, and one is four days per week. 
the part-time um, school psych actually does two days a week here and two days a week at the elementary school. Um, and this year, um, she had actually been out on a maternity leave, uh, Laura Rice, and when she came back, um, Annie and I worked together so that um, she started, we, so we added a second day at the elementary school for her and we were able to start having her work with our sixth grade students, which I thought was um, a good way to help them transition over here to Hopkins so they'd have a familiar face when they came over to Hopkins. So that's worked out well this um, second half of the year. Uh, we also have our board certified behavior analyst who is, um, was in district two and a half days per week. And then full-time speech and language pathologist, the occupational therapist four days a week, our physical therapist two days a week, and then the school adjustment counselor here at Hopkins, which had previously been a three-day-a-week position, and then Actually, we increased that to two four. and a half. Two Actually, and a half. So, so then from we, a point five to a point eight position. Right. So that got increased, which is why we mm -hmm. adjusted the, mm -hmm. the school psychs position. Um, and then we have one registered behavior technician, and then lots of educational support staff. Um, so in working with the special education teachers over at Hadley Elementary, um, these were the resources that um, we kind of organized as what we have in place. So the core curriculum I did list first, uh, we have the <coughs> Reading Street Scott Forsman series and then the Starfall for the kindergarten. And I list those because there's definitely special education, I mean all of our students are getting access to that, but we definitely have um, some special education students who are even coming into the small group setting and working on the Reading Street material. So um, it's definitely programming that we're using even in a small group setting. Um, and then we have, um, through the Read Naturally, we have the GATE program, which is for um, you know first and second graders, and then the Read Naturally um, fluency program, and then also the Read Live, which is another um, we have some special education students accessing that, but lots of regular ed students are accessing the Read Live to work on their fluency. Um, and then for fluency, we also have the Great Leaps program. Um, then we have um, the Wilson Foundations, which is for um, the lower elementary grade, and then the Wilson Reading System for the, um, the upper elementary, um, and then the really great Reading Blast Foundations, ReadWorks, and then one of our special educators is using a lot of materials from Literacy Footprints, and they're, she, um, she really loves it. It's lots of engaging um, uh, literature books that she's mm -hmm. using for some of her reading instruction. If you guys have questions, just stop me. <laughs> I have a quick question. Sure. I was writing notes so I didn't forget later. Just uh, it all related to resources. Um, how many options are there available for resources when it comes to these different types of programs? Like, are these the only programs out there? Are we reevaluating them regularly? Are we getting like teacher feedback to make sure that teachers feel like they're working well? Um, so, do you mean how many resources do we have in district, or are there? So, like, like say, just looking at like the Reading Street or the Starfall. Like, are there other programs out there? Do we evaluate if those are the most appropriate and most effective programs, or is this? because I just don't know, are these the only programs that are really available? So the Reading Street and the Starfall, I'd probably give that question to Annie in terms of like, that's like our core curriculum that mm -hmm. we're doing like across all of the grade levels. So I'm not exactly sure like when we yes. started using uh, Reading Street mm -hmm. or Starfall. Um, so the district has been using these programs for many years because they certainly predate me. Some of the work mm -hmm. that you're describing is work that the Department of Ed has recently been very interested in, which is teaching teachers how to evaluate mm -hmm. curriculum materials. Mm -hmm. We received, we were, there were competitive grants, we applied for one in history that mm -hmm. Mr. Burns had up, uh, led, and we applied for one in English language arts that Ms. Camuso is working on. That work will continue into next year. And so some of what we do, what we will do as part of those grant activities, is start teaching folks how to evaluate curriculum. And there are very good resources, particularly in English and math. Um, there are fewer resources in science and history to evaluate curriculum. So it shows educators what to look for. And also there is a comprehensive site, I'm forgetting the name of the website now, that has already done this analysis, so it's rated these mm -hmm. materials. The materials we use are highly rated, but that doesn't mean that we don't 
need to continually look at them. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many resources available. Okay. So it sounds like we will be. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And then in terms of the more um, specialized programs mm -hmm. that is happening more in the small group special education setting, this is just a small portion of what is available. So mm -hmm. again, that'll be kind of, that's like on my last slide when I talk about recommendations that we definitely want to, I want to continue further discussion with what else do we need? Because, mm -hmm. you know, there are, you know, definitely there's always room for, for growth and there's always new stuff coming out, so yeah. And I have a question based on the uh, the staffing. Um, where we currently have the five special educators, three at Hadley and two at Hopkins. Um, <clears throat> I know that there is the, the one class we had to add additional uh, add an additional teacher for. I know that there, we've been bringing on um, more ESPs than we've had in the past. So it's just um, is is if there is the need, would like a, would a teachers would like a teacher grow with the kids, or would there be like a, a bringing additional staff in for Hopkins, or is there any idea of like if this cadre if the cadre continues on and needs additional support? what that would look like? Um, I haven't really, um, Annie and I haven't really talked about that at this point, um, that I would, there's definitely um, has been, at least since I've been here, and I think historically more of a need at the elementary mm -hmm. um, for some more mm -hmm. like, and again, kind of even thinking like you wanna try to provide as much support when they're younger so that as they get older, um, they're able to be more in their class in mm -hmm. the general ed setting more successfully. So um, definitely something I think would probably it would really be based on numbers each year and how our special ed numbers how we're able to meet those needs as we go forward. So it's not something that I'm feeling we need to do for next year at all. Um, we do have some staff adjustments that we're making for next year in terms of pair, you know ESP staffing um, coming up to Hopkins, but. For next year, we don't need to make any adjustments with the special educators, per se. Next year, we'll also have more of the um, related service providers, OTPT and speech and language. They'll be, um, like currently this year, we only have speech and language coming over to Hopkins to work with students. Next year, we're going to have all three. So some of those adjustments will happen with their scheduling. So some of that fun organization. That's going to be fun. Yeah, that'll be my summer project. <laughs> Um, but like we've already started, you know, I've already started working with the middle school, um, the special educator and the team leader, Susan Duncan, to kind of sort out when is going to be the best time to try to fit that stuff into the middle school schedule. So, And I also would just add that I think that Pam and I are always asking the question with the entire special education team, when, when we're, we're talking about students and their programming, what does it mean for them to have an appropriate education? And that question around a least restrictive environment. So sometimes it absolutely makes sense in any environment to add additional resources because you can provide an appropriate education and it's truly least restrictive. If you find yourself in a situation, we've had these discussions in the past in Hadley, where you're setting up a person, a child for what will feel almost like isolation. Let's say they would be in a substantially separate program and they have no peers in that program and there aren't a lot of opportunities for inclusion. I would argue that that is no longer than the least restrictive environment for that student, that perhaps there's other programs that are less restrictive, but that's driven by looking at individual student needs and then asking those two questions. Uh -huh. So the district would do everything that it would want to do and that it's legally and I would argue morally obligated to do for children. Sometimes the question of what is least restrictive, it's not just a setting, it mm -hmm. depends on the child, what's least restrictive for them. Thank you. All right. Um, and then for the math resources, um, so we have at uh, the elementary school the Envisions math curriculum um, and what I do really like about this it's also kind of how the special education staff is utilizing the reading street programming too is that um, so much of this is online now so the special educators in the classroom teachers they have the ability to if a student's instructional level is below where what their grade level is we can access those resources so they can even you know if they're doing fractions in um, fourth grade but um, in fifth grade, excuse me, but the students at a fourth grade instructional level, they can go into the fourth grade materials and get some 
um, you know, get the math work to instruct the student on that level. So they're not, they're still getting exposure to the curriculum, and it's similar. Also, um, I meant to mention for the reading street reading series, so we can have access depending on instructional level, so that we can keep using that curriculum. Um, the Moby Max is another um, online tool that um, the grades use at the elementary school, and then. Another thing that happens a lot in the resource room settings is a lot of pre-teaching. So the kids will be pulled out for a half an hour block of time to get pre-taught what they'll be going into the classroom to get the lesson in, or vice versa. They can they'll go they'll have the lesson and then they might need some reteaching if they're having struggles. So um, that's how most of the math support is going at this point. And then there's always certain individual objectives that um, the special educators are working on to meet student needs. Um, so at Hopkins, um, so the resources look a little different at Hopkins. So um, in terms of programming uh, resources, they have the Great Leaps Fluency Program and then the Wilson Reading System. But then a lot of, um, at the middle school level, their students are getting instructed um, on the curriculum, the grade level core curriculum, um, usually at a slower pace. They can break things down more. And then at Hopkins, the instruction, a lot of it is support and reteaching or pre-teaching so students can be successful in the general education setting. So, um, because most, again, they're, they're really working towards being in that least restrictive environment with their peers, and that's what high schoolers want to do is be mostly with their peers. So then they're having the time, the different, you know, one or two blocks where they're coming into the resource room to get that extra support to be successful. Um, so I also just wanted to highlight, we have lots of data collection tools that we're using um, to make sure that students are making progress and making sure that we don't need to adjust, you know, don't need to adjust their instruction. So at the elementary school, we have the FastBridge um, learning system. Um, we've all, we're also doing it now up at Hopkins a little bit, which is great news. Is that fast? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they changed their name to FastBridge. Okay. So. <laughs> um, so we can do we do universal screening um, at the elementary level three times a year, and then lots of progress monitoring um, each. And a lot of classroom teachers are doing progress monitoring as well as um, the special education teachers and um, the different um, service providers. Um, then we have the MAP assessments that we're just doing this year for math um, in grades three through six. Then Moby Max has lots of good data that we can access. Um, and then through special education, we have the um, Math Ames Web probes, the Maze probes, which are, that's more of a comprehension assessment. Uh, we have the informal reading inventories, the DRA, which is the developmental reading assessment, and then the Wilson assessment of decoding and encoding, and then just ongoing student assessments and their ongoing work and looking at that. As, uh, no, it's another important piece of data. So we never just want to look at one piece of data. We want to mm -hmm. make sure we're bringing lots of things to the table. So. Um, and so kind of from gathering all of this information, um, I definitely, going into next year, want to keep having discussion about further resources that we might need for reading and math. You know, for example, in reading, we have lots of stuff to work on fluency, but when we're thinking about um, specialized research-based interventions for comprehension or vocabulary work, that's where I see it could be an area that we could boost a little bit. Um, the math, we want to just keep looking. Math is always um, a trickier area to find um, different programming. Um, I, I feel pretty good about the, the Envisions. I have experience with Envisions from my previous district, um, and I think that that does work really well for, um, like I explained earlier, being able to kind of go back and forth with depending on what instructional level students are at. Um, so want to just keep having those discussions with the teachers. I'd wanted to do more of that this year, but um, I ran out of time. <laughs> um, and then um, continuing to work with Annie and the teachers about planning some professional development training opportunities. We have a few things already in the works for staff. Um, we have some HES teachers and some Hopkins Middle School teachers who will be doing some uh, responsive classroom training this summer. Um, to get some additional teachers trained, which I think is um, very exciting. Um, one of our school psychologists is going to go um, this summer to a training to be trained in doing another assessment for uh, working with students with autism, the ADOS. So 
that's really super. I think that's a great um, step for the district because we have Laura Rice is already trained, and so if I can get when Amanda Ryan, the other school psychologist, gets trained, then they can team together to do those assessments. So I'm super excited about that, and they are as well. Um, and then um, I have another teacher who will get some Wilson training this summer. So got some good things planned um, so far. Um, then just want to keep working with teachers um, to enhance kind of just how we're approaching different student needs, whether it's academic or social emotional. Annie and I have had tons of conversations about this and um, kind of looking at um, the framework from the problem solving process. We're kind of really you know, identifying what the problem is, analyzing it, trying to come up with a plan, implementing the plan, and then going back and seeing, all right, is it working? If, if it's not working, what do we need to adjust? And kind of really just using that as a framework for how we're kind of working on lots of different um, areas of need throughout the district. Mm -hmm. um, and then continuing, obviously, to collaborate, review data, um, so that we are meeting the students' needs. I also think you know, one of the challenges of being a smaller school district um, and not having as much staff is that is the scheduling piece. Um, so really trying to figure out ways to be creative with scheduling to meet individual needs because all students don't just fit into, you know, this is the fifth grade group or this is the fourth grade group. So really trying to be creative with um, the special education teachers and the principal on how we can um, do some of that scheduling so that all the student needs are being met. So, any questions? I have one, Pam. Um, sure. it, and it, are there any technology or materials needs that you feel are um, really necessary in order to support these next steps? Um, the, the need that probably comes up the most that I hear about um, and is probably the um, need for some more iPads for like doing some different things with students. Mm -hmm. um, that we have students who have individual needs for iPads, and so we've been able to. I've been able to work with Maureen Tumenis and Dave Olson about making sure we have them. But that could be a need. I don't have a specific like I need ten iPads or something, yeah. but um, just kind of making sure they have access to that. Right. Um, the Google, the Chromebooks have been fabulous, and Great. I think the the more everyone is becoming familiar with the Google Classroom and mm -hmm. all the, what that has to offer and even using the um, text-to-speech for, for speech-to-text for that has been tremendous. Yeah. Um, so I think just continuing to, the fact that kids have such great access to that I think is huge, so okay. yeah. And Maureen Tumenis is, um, she's always coming up with different apps and sending me things about, um, should we look into this, should we look into that? So I think that's a good strength as well. Well, I think as part of our technology planning, we want to yeah. be sure that we're incorporating yeah. if, you know, iPads are more conducive to either the resources that you're using yeah. or the way that um, the kids are interacting with those yeah. resources, that right. we consider that in, in addition to what we may need for um, other needs in the classroom. Yeah, I would say the thing we have to do first, and I've talked with Dave a little bit, but Maureen more, and then even um, previously Mike Duffy, is really kind of taking inventory on like where are all the iPads mm -hmm. um, and who's like responsible for which ones. Yeah. And um, kind of, so I would say that would need to really be the first step because maybe we would find we have because <laughs> so, you've got some that are assigned to, to specific right there's the I, yeah I'm not yeah. totally clear on the yeah. process and I think there might be a couple little processes out there so I think we just have to kind of okay. um, kind of just sort that out which Great. is totally doable yeah thank you and I have a question um, especially like bringing in like with the least restrictive environment um, and trying to keep the kids in the classroom as much as possible are you finding that there's <laughs> adequate time for um, for the general education teachers to meet with and discuss students with the with, uh, with the special education teachers? Like, do they have that time to collaborate on on student needs and like what they're doing in the general ed curriculum to get it into special ed and all that stuff? I mean, we're we're doing it. It's again that is another scheduling challenge. Um, more so, I would say at the elementary level than at the middle school and high school level. You know, at the middle school level. Yeah, it's, it's really a scheduling challenge. So we're doing it, like we have, I have a couple of different regular set scheduled consults that we do, um, that teachers and staff will do together, but it's, it's always kind of, where do you find the time? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 
but it's an ongoing discussion. I think every year, probably for every school building across <laughs> America. <laughs> Paul, any questions? Yes. I would just like to thank you as both a school committee member and a parent. Um, just you're always very responsive and coming in and giving this presentation and any time we've asked you to come up and everything like that, it's, it's, it's been a good experience. So I just wanted oh. to thank you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to hearing regularly from you and getting updates. And then, as Heather said, like if there's anything that we need to be looking at as a school committee mm -hmm. for resources or be thinking about funding in a certain way to keep us posted. Okay, absolutely. Right. And I guess I would say the same. If there's things that you want to know more about, then you can also let me know because um, if I have to come here every yep. year, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We aren't shy. We'll bring it up. <laughs> yeah. And Miss Haywood, I don't think you got to formally meet Jack Kelly, a student at Hopkins Academy. I'm a student Jack. rep here. Yes. Nice to meet you. I pointed out. He figured it out from the first slide. Oh. He didn't. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, did you have any questions? Oh, nothing at all. All right. All right. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, a couple more presentations here. Field trips. So in your packet, I, I, I put information on surveys that I gave to parents, faculty at Hopkins, uh, Hopkins faculty. And the reason that Hadley Elementary, I, I limited this to Hopkins, is that's where, as you know, you're approving some of the more expensive and involved field trips. This is just a starting point to give you some feedback. And you can see that there wasn't huge response, so I'll ask folks again in the future. My goal is to have for you, because it would certainly help me, a master calendar of what you've approved, when you've approved it, who's eligible, if it's a grade level, like a seventh or eighth grade, or if it's only high school students are eligible, who's eligible, when is it happening, where are they going, and how much does it cost? Mm -hmm. And so as field trips come before you, you can see these are already all approved for the upcoming year. And um, as each one comes forward, you can just have a sense of where things fall. Mm -hmm. This was just meant to give you some feedback and to let you know that I will create some kind of calendar because it's hard for me to keep track. Well, it sounds like, too, that there's um, some feedback that almost points to um, what might be out there in the future that we don't yet know about, but is kind of a you know either a standing trip or something that yes. is you know historically this class has always gone to like like the nature's classroom or a DC trip things mm -hmm. like that that parents can plan for well um, in advance well in advance before, mm -hmm. but also knowing that it's coming in terms of an opportunity for their kid mm -hmm. you know they might rethink going to DC as a family because mm -hmm. they know that their kid's going to DC with the class trip right. next year. So I think that that might be helpful. Yeah. And continue to evaluate financial costs of those yep. to make sure yeah. we're making the most cost effective. Absolutely. Without so cutting back on opportunity. So yeah. yeah. That was just meant to be informational. Cool. Great. And Heather uh, had asked, particularly about the band trip, because we have parents sometimes, I can think of one parent who's been extremely helpful to us, who also happens to be a travel agent. And so we brought up the question of, is this something we're supposed to be going out and getting quotes on? And I contacted the school attorney, Attorney Dupre. He said, that's not necessary. There would be a conflict of interest or an ethics violation if the travel agent were related to any member of the school committee, the administration, the building administration where the field trip's taking place, or to me, or to any of the teacher chaperones, like the primary organizers of the trip. So a relative of theirs could not be the um, travel agent, but other than that, it's not a problem. We don't have to do anything other than what we've been doing. Great. Great. Thank you for confirming that. Unless you're about to tell me that the person's related to me, in which case, just wait till after. We're not <laughs> Long last cousin. That's right. All right. Good. Anything else on that? No. All right. Then uh, changes to charter school reimbursement formula. Yes. Thank you to Peter Demling, who is a school committee member in Amherst. Mm -hmm. And did I forward this to you, Jack? Uh, oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, you can look at that too. He did this wonderful analysis. So the governor's recommended a change to charter reimbursement. And the reason I included this in your packet was because I believe it was Humera, or perhaps it was you, Heather. One of you had said, "Is this something that we want to have a school committee response to?" And um, these data were uh, compiled, as I said, by Peter. 
And you can see that on the first page, it lists the districts that will suffer the most financially, but even Hadley uh, will lose over $83,000. If this were to uh, go through, if the changes to charter reimbursement were to go through. So I believe that there are many districts that are really just trying to encourage the department of, well, in this case, the legislature to figure out how to fund those promises that they've already made, whether that's circuit breaker, regional transportation reimbursement, or the charter aid formula, rather than um, changing it because as you can see this isn't good for the town of Hadley and you've seen the graphs that I put in the budget for years now the town hasn't gotten what it's been owed so that money would absolutely be just gone forever not like it's coming back in years past when it hasn't been fully funded and then the town would stand to um, lose money in the future would not get nearly what it would if the current system were funded fully funded so at the last meeting, um, I had asked if we were comfortable looking at basically writing on, you know, as a committee, uh, the language that um, Mask had provided us, the framing, mm -hmm. but with our actual dollars uh, mm -hmm. associated with it, the impact to us. So it sounds like we can utilize that to craft our own letter. Uh, for review so that we can at least have something, you know, out there on a, a position statement from us. I think that sounds really reasonable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think we can do that for the next meeting, right? And bring okay. it forward. Yeah. I was just looking to see if there was some kind of deadline for writing. Hey, anyone? Let me think about that. Um, can you remind me just to clarify what you just said? So of the 117 that we're supposed to get, uh, have we not been receiving that on an annual basis? No, and I wish I didn't bring my computer in with me. Um, I can also just for a reminder, resend, because it's already been out in public documents, and I think it's also in the budget document, but I can resend how underfunded it's been for the last several years, specifically to Hadley, how much money the town was owed versus what it actually received. And that's under the existing okay. formula. The existing formula just isn't fully funded. It, it, I'm imagining it must be written as subject to appropriation, like other reimbursements. Right. And um, so every year they, they haven't appropriated enough to fully fund it. And can you just reiterate what exactly we're supposed to do? Renumerated. What are, what are we supposed to be compensated for? What are we compensated for currently? It's a percent. No, what, are, what, is, what are we supposed to? What is the loss of their, the funds? They're, they're reimbursing us for what? Increases to charter tuitions, which are particularly important to small schools. So the amount of money that, if you recall, the charter tuition, it's not a set amount at each school. This charter school costs right. this much. It is. Each district pays a different amount to each different charter school. And some of that is dependent upon the amount of money that the district spends on its own students and the percent above required, the percent above foundation that the town is essentially spending on students. And when enrollments decrease, the percent above foundation goes up unless you radically cut programs. And so every year those tuitions are going up. So it, in a weird way, the way that the tuition, the tuition system, not the reimbursement is set up, the way the tuition system is set up, that as things get worse for small districts with declining enrollments, they get much better for charter schools in terms of the tuitions that they get from those schools. And what's supposed to happen now is that this town is supposed to get aid when their actual payments go up. And in the new formula, they're saying, actually, you won't see any aid at all, regardless of if your tuitions go up, unless you exceed what we determine to be your max enrollment. So you could actually have, in some cases, our tuitions can go up and our enrollment could say relatively flat, and we could still see an increase in tuition, potentially, based on what I just described to you. Um, but in this case, if we weren't, if, if actual enrollment hadn't exceeded a set max cap 
then there'd be no reimbursement whatsoever. I'd, okay, thanks. I think I just found the document with the actual versus owed for charter reimbursement. Oh, thank you. Um, if I have the right thing up, and you probably do. It looks like in the FY18, we got like 49% of mm -hmm. what we were owed. Um, FY19, 30%, 60%, 17, 98% um, 98 and 14, 73% and 15. So. And then things got worse. And so under the existing system, the town isn't getting everything that it's owed. But under the projected system, as, as Mr. Demlin points out, um, we there'd be nothing. At least we're getting a percentage of something, but things would be worse under what's recommended by, right, by the governor. So this letter would really be bringing attention to uh, our state representatives and essentially uh, telling them what, our, what the impact is to our district uh, and attaching to them the bigger impact across mm -hmm. the state so that they understand and can um, hopefully support lobbying for, you know, uh, a change to this. Okay, great. So we can, I, I hope it's not too late to wait till the next meeting to try to tackle this. Uh, if it is, does, if the committee wants to give you authority to write something based on the mask, um, then you're covered based on MASC's recommendations and using the data in the packet. I think using the data and using mm -hmm. the sample message, I, I mm -hmm. think we would just craft it to our district and not add anything beyond that, but just making sure that they know that we're in and mm -hmm. it's, it impacts us as well. If you're willing. Yeah, happy I'm, to. No, I'm, I'm very comfortable with I that. I think Annie and I can get yep. that pulled yeah. together. Okay, great. Does that make Thank sense you. for you, Paul? If, yeah, that'd be great, uh, thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. that's it for presentations and discussion items. Mm -hmm. There was no action on that one, right? Nope. Yeah, okay, uh, personnel report. The, pos the positions we still, yes, so we have several retirements. Uh, we have a one-year leave, Ms. Cullen in the Guidance Counselor at Hopkins Academy. We uh, are, we have hired a new physics teacher, we have hired a new chemistry teacher, and we have hired a new social studies teacher at the middle school. Uh, Ms. Barden, who is at the high school, uh, is leaving. She's moving. Her and her family are moving to California. The new person we hired will teach middle school, and Ms. Roberts will move up to the high school. And the positions, I am currently interviewing candidates uh, for Ms. Dasati's position in as uh, English as a second language, and uh, I have done first interviews, uh, candidates have done a written performance assessment, and beginning tomorrow we'll have candidates come in and teach a, a lesson that Ms. Dasati and I will observe. Uh, we are closing in on our elementary physical education appointment. Uh, we had teachers come in and do a model lesson and meet the students. Uh, and so that will leave us only with having to find a one-year replacement for Ms. Cullinan. That's no small feat. Uh, and other than that, I think that's all of them. Taken care of. Is there no current plan to, I guess, fill the vacancy left by Mr. O's, I guess, leaving last year? I don't know the reasoning behind why he's no longer with this school, but... I'm assuming there's no plans to fill in the space there and What start. academic area was that, Jack? Uh, he did a lot of the food science classes and the like home economics classes. Mm -hmm. uh, the only one that he taught that was like part of the state curriculum was health for um, freshmen, and Ms. Salzy has currently taken that over. But I'm assuming there's no plans to... So what we ended up doing in that, Jack, was when we looked at the enrollments for those courses, they were so, we had such low enrollments there around a little bit earlier than now, let's say closer to April last year, or maybe the big, that was probably the April school committee. The school committee got a copy of that schedule, but it had projected enrollments in it. And the enrollments were very low in many of those courses. In some cases, they were zero. <coughs> and we had uh, what we considered to be over enrollments in some math classes. So actually, even though the head count hasn't changed, the, the point time, the amount of time that math teachers are working. So we increased the math department because we had over enrollment there. 
and we eliminated those courses. We just shifted those resources over. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So, so that's what. So I would think as part of kind of going back to our earlier discussion about program of studies that as um, more of those different courses and, and offerings come up that we may need to, and that was one of the questions, was what kind of recruiting or hiring we may need to do for a subject area that students are interested in versus being able to utilize staff that we already have that could support that new course. So um, I think that that's something that we would have to keep in mind because um, every year we have to look at how many full-time uh, educators we have uh, included in mm -hmm. covering the courses that we have and being able to make sure that we aren't um, overextending anybody or bringing somebody in for a, a low volume of students that don't really support a full-time uh, teacher. But definitely that's, I could see where some of these future course offerings would potentially require somebody with an expanded skill set set or different skill set than what we may have here already. Yeah. I'm interested to see that kind of ties in with the with the new program the studies that we're offering. Mm -hmm. Based on that interest, I think it'll help us evaluate where we might go next. Yeah. Or where the teachers might find it appropriate. All right. Any other questions on the personnel report? Okay. Um, public comment. All of our public has left. Okay, uh, business manager report. Are you giving us the business manager report? I am letting you know. <laughs> no, I am letting you know that the finance reports are in your packet. Yep. However, the uh, budget summary report, what we refer to as the expense report, uh, it'll. There are a lot of encumbrances that still need to be adjusted in this report. What you're going to see in June is that Chris will bring to you. Uh, all of the requests for line item transfers and um, and the accounts will be you won't see nearly as much in the negative whereas it's still right now it's all over you see lines that are in the negative and you see lines that have a lot of money that will get sorted out in the next uh, report and I do know for a fact that there are some places where we still have too much money encumbered so that could be for could be for a couple of different reasons. I know one place where the encumbrances are off are our tuitions to non-public schools. So if we had a student who was going to an out-of-district placement and that placement changed, and in the business office they're still encumbering, as so the student's going to be there until June, but the student isn't there anymore, then our encumbrances start to get off. So those things will be adjusted in June. I got the text from Chris that he has absolutely no worries, but the expense report will be cleaned up in June. Um, in grants, really because we are carrying over almost $200,000 in circuit breaker, because we're using a good chunk of that in the FY20 operating budget, um, pretty much everything is spent down except for the uh, health services grant, the ESHS health grant, and that will be completely spent down before the end of the year. So you'll only have circuit breaker money carried over for use in FY20. It's already been applied to the FY20 operating budget. And my favorite, the revolving accounts. Notice there's still multiple X's under lunch, although I do know as we do every year, we'll be transferring expenses uh, into the operating budget. And you may notice that last month you voted on school choice. Uh, this was printed, Chris did this before that actually went through, your vote went through at your last school committee meeting, but on the town side, they haven't applied those monies yet. But Chris has made that adjustment. So you'll see a big chunk of money come off in June from school choice. Mm -hmm. And again, it's already happened on our end. We just, uh, we just need to, or the town needs to catch up with us or we need to catch up with the town. We usually see a big um, chunk come off on the student accounts too, in terms yes. of graduation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Yes. yes, class activities, things like that. Yes, yes, you will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions? On What's going on with the? Seems pretty even. Lunch. What's going on with what? I'm sorry, you're breaking up. No. <laughs> with lunch, you said. So. I can't hear you. Uh, sorry. It, it will 
be balanced at the end of the year. We still will transfer expenses into the operating budget like we do every year. And uh, Ms. Zach is doing what she does every year, which is working hard to try to collect uh, all outstanding debts. And just because this happened to recently be highlighted in the news, maybe you could just recap for us what our policy is for a student who cannot um, pay or doesn't have money on their account for a lunch um, in terms of they're not denied a lunch, they're absolutely given food, yes. um, they're not given a special Yeah, we uh, don't do alternate a special lunch. menu, Correct. so people can't pinpoint that child as you got that sandwich so you're part of this group that mm -hmm. you know um, and that uh, obviously there are reminders through the system and communications that have gone out to try to uh, collect any unpaid balances but that kids are not being denied lunch or given a different alternative lunch if they can't afford it no I think the news referred to that as, as lunch shaming that, yes. that isn't my word no, we don't. The only thing that we do is we don't allow students who owe anything on their account to get, what do you call these things? Like extras? A la carte. Mm -hmm. I have like the bells and whistles. Ice cream. I don't eggs. even get school lunch. Yeah, so whatever. Well, I often walk He actually just eats bells and whistles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's the, only, that's the only time that students would be. They couldn't order a la carte, the extra ice add, cream. Add on yes. standard lunch. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Oh. All right. Anything else on uh, business manager reports? No. Okay. School committee reports um, on the various subcommittees. I don't know that we have anything, but let's just check policy. We don't have anything. No. We're moving. We've already got our reappointed uh, groups. Yes. Finance tri board. I don't. There hasn't been any activity since we last met. Capital and Fields. So Capital and Fields, we're moving along, right? We're in good shape here. We are in good shape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's good. Tell me what what's the what's currently happening? What are the next steps, Andy? So we have enough we feel confident that we're well situated to complete phase one of the fields. We are wrapping up some um, private property kind of questions and details and that's being handled by two private parties and not by the schools and once that is completely taken care of uh, we will put out a bid we'll go out to bid and we still are hoping to begin the project this summer we still think that that is within the realm of possibility late summer but that's still our plan that's great great work thanks all right, and yes, and we'd like to uh, obviously thank folks for coming out to the annual town meeting and um, supporting our warrant article for the uh, CPA funding from the remainder of phase one. Definitely, the and for supporting the school department budget. Thank Absolutely, you. yep. All right, and uh, collaborative. I haven't, Humera can't join us, so yeah, I, I haven't seen I anything from her. There's been a meeting, yeah. All right, uh, on to remaining action items. So approval of AP warrants submitted in April 2019. Is there a motion? Move to approve the AP warrants submitted in April 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I will abstain. All right, approval of April 30th, 2019 minutes. Is there a motion? Just before, I just, yeah, I, I missed this before. The signature of bills and payrolls. I think we just need to add Humera on there as a signer. I think she's the first person signer. In the I didn't minutes. catch it before. Okay. Yeah. Yep. It says Brugger and Shannon. I think Humera too. Okay. That's right. And it's then Paul's right. the alternative. Thank you. Good catch. That was. I just saw it now. All right. So motion to motion to approve the April thirtieth, two thousand nineteen minutes. With that adjustment. Yep, with the adjustment of signers. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, approval of warrants submitted in April 2019. Is there a motion? Move to s approve the warrants. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we did history, we did program of studies, and we did the public position. Um, agreed to move forward with that. Great. Great. Okay, our next meeting is June 24th. Um, 
5.30. Unfortunately, I know I am traveling that day. Okay. So you all can either meet without me or we can see if there's a different day the week prior. Um, I don't know that time of year how easy or hard it is to get convened. Um, I can do the week prior, the 17th. I cannot do that day. I can't do the 17th, but I could do the 18th. 17th is the last day of school and mm -hmm. half day and there's stuff going on. Uh, Tuesday, I could also do Wednesday the 19th. That would work better for me. Which one? The 19th. Wednesday the 19th. Are you available Wednesday the 19th, Paul? I'm yep, happy. yep, that'll be the 20th. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, but I can make it. Okay. okay. So we're going to do that Wednesday the 19th. And Jack is joining us this summer. Yes. Yeah, I don't really have a problem with that. You are the best. Wow. As you've noticed, I already have a lot of projects for this. I'm all about this. Great. <laughs> this is fantastic. All right. So on that um, meeting, we did say we wanted to start talking about the process for um, studying the later start time at Hopkins. Mm -hmm. That was the, the charge right. in terms of... Uh, the decision from the last meeting and at least putting together a okay if we're going to formally explore this what should the process mm -hmm. be who should it include um just a broader than what we did we did previously um so good and any other requested topics for next meeting so there is that question about um have the kids and the after school is that something that we're going to end up talking about or is that we are when i hear that? from the town so they uh, what i asked was that um it's my understanding that the select board already had a discussion about park and rec taking on Hadley kids. So I've asked, although folks have spoken to me about whether or not the school department would be willing to do this, my answer has been the school department will do whatever we need to do to be helpful to the town and to Hadley kids. But since it's already been discussed at the level of select board, I suggested that once they've sorted it out, that the chair of the select board um, email the chair of the school committee to say we if this is what they want to do we would like the school department to consider running this i i don't want to position the school committee to be overstepping mm -hmm. if another board is already in this conversation awesome yeah so just it might be a topic process, depending so. on the timing yeah so it could very well be i just don't know what we're here from. um another topic that might be of interest is uh i know that david phil is exploring um how to go about getting a school zone yes um, mm -hmm. uh, basically installed or approved in front of uh, Hadley mm -hmm. Elementary uh, in order to reduce the speed um, he had mentioned recently at their mm -hmm. select board meeting that the signs that have been out there for um, speed cautions were when they were uh, quote-unquote off were actually registering um, speeds of the cars going by mm -hmm. and with them top speed of I think it was 72 miles an hour uh, that doesn't yeah. shock me at all yeah it doesn't shock me but it is you know it's just shocking to think mm -hmm. that <laughs> that's right by the school so um, years ago there had been a, a kind of a grassroots effort to look into it and um, there was a response at that time from mass DOT that I think has since been revisited and potentially changed so David is taking that up um, and has uh, basically has included us in those communications. So I, I would think that that may be a topic we could just sure. give an update on um, at our next meeting. And I also have, uh, Jack wanted, he had asked about this last <coughs> month and I had requested, which he agreed to, to wait until Chris was with us in June. But he, when we did the budget, wanted, had questions or wanted to see more detail in terms of the capital plan, what's on it, why, and the detail behind that, what it means. So we'll make sure we have that for June as well. Yep. Good. Great. It's the least I can do since I signed you up for all these other projects. And <laughs> really I'm, I'm just looking at our, our minutes. You had mentioned uh, the retreat. So we do need to get that scheduled. Um, and we could probably announce that date when we meet in yep. June and um, start forming a, an agenda for that retreat. And I will get the right location. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'll be back in I'll be back in August if you can wait. Yeah, I bet we can. Cool. When I you will come say back? that the um, more than fifty percent of the schools across New Zealand are closed today. They have two major unions that cover the entire country, and then all the teachers are striking like, across those. So at least the about fifty some odd percent. The uh, current offer from the federal national government is a 3% raise uh, and they're, um, which would cost the country $1.2 billion but they, uh, they're not happy with that. Mm-hmm. They said they've been, uh, they haven't been given a raise for a while. So that just interesting how the politics play out here versus us negotiating district by district. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Although we have seen some states where similar kind of uh, Strike walkouts. Mm-hmm. Um, West Virginia. I think Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, West yep. Virginia. Even locally, we have a district yep. that's at work to rule. Mm-hmm. Northampton's mm-hmm. at work to rule right mm-hmm. now. Yep. When are you back, Paul? In terms of scheduling, when do you when do you return? Uh, back in the country, August first. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, so we'll make it like August second. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Eight a.m. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> Okay, um, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Probably didn't need to do that, but we do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs>